Thanks for that, John. Um, so as, as I was saying, it's, it's, it's a curiosity as to, to why I would be willing to tell you a story, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Tom, my old skipper used to say to me, what's a fella from Carlo uh, doing sailing? Um, so I'll, I'll give you some background that, that brought me to the, to the sailing world initially, and then we'll go into the boats that I've played with. Um, and then uh, some of the things that I'm kind of thinking of doing in, in sailing, either with my local sailing club or beyond um, towards the end of the talk. I initially, what I'll do is I'll give you a couple of waypoints, waypoints that brought me uh, to sailing. Coming from Carlo, it's not something you, you would expect. Um, educated in CBS Carlo, nothing special there, but um, <clears throat> the things that, that, that brought me to and certainly Tom will, will, will appreciate, it, is my woodworking skills. In school, I did woodwork and I loved it. Uh, I also did uh, tech drawing and I loved that too. Uh, those two subjects kind of gave me confidence early in school to do better, I suppose. We'll see why they're useful in, in a little bit. RTC Carlo, nothing special there, but um, what was special is the J1, a rite of passage for, for, I suppose, a lot of students, particularly back then. Um, <clears throat> coming from Carlo, I found myself on, on an airplane for the first time in my life, uh, finding myself in New York, uh, blagged my way, um, as some people know I kind of do that sometimes, onto that boat. So that's a, uh, a paddle wheeler uh, that used to operate out of Pier 17 in the uh, South Street, Street Seaport District of New York. Um, I worked on that and another boat called uh, the Dewitt Clinton. That was the Andrew Fletcher, if I remember. Had a wonderful time. Um, hung out with sailor types in the South Street Seaport Museum um, in, the, in the shadow, as you can see, of the World Trade Center. Um, had, had a wonderful time, but hanging out with the, the museum folks, my first introduction to sailing came on this guy. This, this is the, um, the, the uh, uh, pioneer that uh, plies its trade in the tourist business out of um, Pier 16, if I, if I recall. It's, it's, it's a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> So that was a wonderful time, and that was my first time working on the water, being on the water. Uh, again, yeah, from Carlo, not exactly things that one would do. Um, wonderful time. I knew I'd go back to something on the water, but never sure what. I was 20 at the time. Um, I finished up my education uh, in, in Manchester. Um, in, in 1989, I returned home as a graduate engineer, uh, joined uh, Telecom Air. Um, but a fella needed a hobby. Um, <clears throat> the hobby naturally uh, was a bit of sailing. Uh, I stamped up and joined the Irish National Sailing School, Alistair and Arthur Rumble and all the guys. Um, hung out there for a good few years. Probably I think Alistair and Arthur were slightly embarrassed that, that I was hanging out too much and paying them, continue to pay with them, but, but I had fun, enjoyed it. Um, took any opportunity to sail any boat that they would they would let me have a go on. Uh, we did some cruising down in West Cork, in in Killaloo and Clare, places like that. Uh, a, a wonderful time, wonderful people, still wonderful friends from there. Um, I moved after a couple of years with the Irish National Sailing School, and as we know, they have a club, and they're probably responsible for, I would say, putting more people on the water in Ireland than than than, than a lot. They they do wonderful work even today. Um, but I sailed a little bit then, raced a little bit with a couple of guys out of the Irish on a J24 for, if I recall, about two seasons. Um, and, and then through a kind of an acquaintance, friend of a friend, etc., I got my transfer papers. And I got not necessarily transferred, but there was a crowd out of Holt that needed a bowman for uh, the Cruiser Challenge, uh, if I remember. It, that was run out of the Leary in late August, September, from memory on the next boat, joined them, had a blast. Um, that day was the first time I broached the boat, well, not that I broached the boat, but sorry, Tom, but you were driving, you, you, you broached the boat that day. Um, but I enjoyed their company, it was good fun. I got my transfer papers. I stayed sailing with, with the guys in Hoth and Tom, I'm delighted to see Tom here, um, on various boats. Um, what we see here is a 33.7 uh, called Breeze, it tremendous fun. Um, but prior to that, the guys had a, uh, an IMX 38, which was even better fun altogether. Unfortunately, I don't have, have too many pictures of it. Um, later, uh, a, a 33.7, uh, 
um, myself and Tom had the pleasure, um, which is not something always one does, but the pleasure of going over to the factory, picking it up, sailing it from there via, via Belle-Isle, if I remember, um, to uh, La Trinité in France to do the Spee West regatta. And we can see a picture here uh, of the helicopter coming over, looking at the Mad Paddy sailing, sailing in, in that regatta. We, we had fun. Um, with that boat, we and 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 Tom and and all the rest of the guys, we had just a blast. Um, some some wonderful memories. So, <clears throat> what brought me to gaff rig boats and why? Uh, um, I was in the midst of Bermudan race and thought and saw nothing else. Um, but I suppose if 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 I describe a scene of your average Wednesday in July, June, we kind of race out from work. Um, typically, you have a lovely flat sea, lovely sky. You might get a gentle breeze uh, to ghost you along. One Wednesday, and I can still remember it, um, coming around uh, out of Hoth, under Ireland's eye, there was this scene. Not this particular scene, but a scene of Hoth 17s just ghosting along in a tight formation, uh, topsails flying, the colours. It was um, Kevin Darmody, who sailed with us, um, I remember saying, oh, God, that's, that's something, isn't it? Um, from that, a trip was organized. I had a trip. Um, I can't remember the name of the boat, but immediately I was just struck by the history, uh, the sense of responsibility of, of owning such a boat, um, but, but also the motion. So I'd been used to kind of uh, Bermudans, uh, fin keelers, uh, and very quickly on the on the night I sailed, it was a lively enough night. I kind of immediately felt the different motion that one gets from a long keeled boat. Um, not that I said that's it. I'm leaving Tom. I continued to stay, sail with Tom, but in, in the back of my head, I started thinking about these things. Um, one of the Kevin, one of the crew, used to call me a, a you know a potential log chopper. Um, at the time, two can do was being built. I was kind of keeping an eye on that. I, I knew someday, perhaps one day, who knows what way it would turn that I might, I, if I was certainly to stay. I was a member of Hoth at that time. If I was to remain in Hoth, probably one day I'd end up with a Hoth 17. Alas, I, I didn't stay in Hoth. Um, work and all sorts kept dragging me further and further south that now I live in Greystones. But that was my first introduction to kind of gaffers. I hadn't thought uh, about them. Um, but yeah, who, you know, who wouldn't find them beautiful? Um, I continued to sail with Tom and the guys. Life was getting busy. There was other priorities getting in the way. Small matter of getting married, um, kids coming. Um, uh, and I grew up in a uh, DIY household. Um, it, it's no stranger that, that I myself am probably a committed, fanatical DIYer. So I was busy with that. Um, less and less did I appear to sail with Tom and the guys in Hope, but you know, every now and again I would. I gradually then moved to, to sailing in Greystone Sailing Club. I joined Greystone Sailing Club kind of for a bit of a headspace. Promised myself that I wasn't going to go racing. I was just going to go for fun. But every time I, I'd go down to Greystones, and no matter how late I'd leave it, um, somebody would say, oh yeah, look, they're going to hold the start for you. Just go on out there. So I, I kind of thought better of it and said, okay, maybe I should put a bit of commitment into, into the uh, racing. So I raced uh, lasers for a bit, had wonderful fun. Um, in the midst of all my madness of DIY and doing up houses and building houses and, and helping with kids, etc., I still was dreaming of dreaming about what would the boating do? Would I ever, ever even go back to boating? I didn't know, but DIY was sort of an, an, a thing. I found myself in the boat show at once at one point for um for Stephen's birthday Tom you may remember um and I bought a book I bought a book the um the classic boat construction by uh Lynn um not Lynn Par Party um I've forgotten his first name um just digested that book thought this was magical I knew that I'd never probably build a boat of that size in, in my life it was too big too much of an expense but read it um that book brought me to a, a book which I'm sure some of you have on your shelves, or most of you even have both of these books on your shelves. But the Hardell Shapel book um, was just a treasure. 
um, um, some of the chapters on lofting I found just fascinating. And again, that brings me back to the, um, and that's why I kind of talked about the um, uh, technical drawing that I did in school. I went and lofted uh, the, the, some of the boats that Howard has in his book. Uh, he gives uh, the table of offsets and somebody who's done some lofting knows what that means. That I, I, I ended up lofting and I just, just for want of a bit of headspace, I'd go into AutoCAD and I'd loft and draw and loft and draw and it was lovely. I came across uh, John Leather's book, another wonderful book. I, I've loads of books, but um, some of these are the, the highlights. Obviously the design and planning from Howard Chapel as well. It's another wonderful one. Of course, I came across Ian Oaktred. That's how his name is pronounced. I'm not sure about how he, I suppose, developed the uh, glued lap strake or glued clinker uh, plywood uh, construction. Um, I, I found he's both fascinating. I bought a couple of his plans. His plans are wonderfully detailed, um, particularly for the beginner. He shows everything. You don't need to ha have too much knowledge and you can go and start building. Um, so that, that was good. I also started following designers. So this is a designer, uh, Paul Gartside, who uh, designs. Uh, Paul, as some of you will know, he's from, I think, Cornwall initially, um, now in British Columbia in, in Canada, uh, and sells his plans online. He has a couple of lovely gaff-rigged uh, itch and ferry types. Uh, uh, Paul was kind enough I rang him one day for the fun of it. Uh, he was kind enough to send uh, some drawings to allow me to make a half hole, which which was nice. Of a twenty-one foot gaff cutter called Surprise, if if I remember. So, um, you have to turn dreams into reality, I suppose. Sometimes, um, I started thinking about getting skills of uh, of boat building. How would I do that? Um, do I just get stuck in or do I go to a school? I, I came across the wooden boat school in, in, in Maine, Camden, Maine. Never got to go there. Would have been nice, just logistics costs, etc. I also came across the boat building academy in Lyme Regis. Now, I, I did get to go there, um, which was, was fantastic. I, I booked myself into a series of back-to-back -back type of one-week courses uh, in January of, I can't remember what year, hotels, books, flight booked, all that stuff. Um, in December, they rang me and said, oh, well, we're going to cancel because of the uh, lack of interest. Uh, while I explained I had um, purchased my tickets, I had the hotel booked, I probably wasn't going to get any money back. They said, well, why don't you just come over anyway? So I, I went over. Um, first day was they were trying to make sure that I wasn't going to cut my fingers off with tools. Uh, also explaining to me that, you know, if you're trying to have a uh, a life-changing experience and make some money out of this gig you're not going to do it go work mcdonald's you might make more money but they kind of got a measure of me that i was here to learn uh, probably by all the questions i was asking notes i was taking um so i had fun there um uh, there, there was a uh, 12 foot rowing boat there clinker traditional clinker built that was built by a previous student but a number of the planks were put on badly so that kind of explained to me that there weren't be able to Go do anything with this boat so just take a couple of planks off put them back on if you make it as bad as it is no, no worries because it's bad anyway if you make it better we might be able to perhaps sell it so i spent about four or five days doing a couple of planks um on that boat um they were kind enough to tell me that they probably might be able to sell this boat at the end of end of the time i also worked on a hershoff 12 and a half if anybody knows those another beautiful boat by Hershoff designer in, in the US. Um, so that was kind of my introduction. I was now I now needed an excuse to, to build, but I, at least I knew I had the skill set. Um, the Boat Building Academy gave me some of the course notes that they would give to the longer courses and some of the work examples that they gave. So I got them. They gave me, you know, some of the materials like copper, nails, robes, etc. Brought them home, started practicing. Um, this all isn't really in chronological order, but sometime later, uh, I came across the uh, Illan Boat Building School, or more so the island down in, in West Cork, Baltimore, uh, and the boat that Conor O'Brien built and, and, and essentially sold, sailed it to the Falklands and sold it to the Falklands. 
um, I came across Gary McMahon, who had set up the boat building school and the wonderful tales and stories that he tells. And we all know him because we've seen the island up, uh, up and down the, the Irish Sea at this point. Um, but uh, Gary was also offering uh, workshops where you could just go down, turn up for a week. Obviously, he was looking for donations towards the project, and that was okay. Um, but I, I went down for a number of workshops down to Hegarty's Boatyard. Um, <clears throat> That was just a wonderful experience. Um, the Hegarty brothers themselves, hugely generous with their time. Again, me asking questions, taking notes. Uh, I worked with Faulkner uh, quite a bit on some of the visits and some of the other guys down there. Um, the thing that's kind of interesting for me is the touch points that, that, that you get from other people. Um, when I was down there on one trip, Tim Lee, um, Tim Lee is, is, a, is a shipwright in the Port San, Townsend um, Shipwright Company. Um, anybody who is kind of chasing social media will, will, will know Tim from uh, the restoration of the Western Flyer, which is Steinbeck's boat. Um, and you'll also see him on YouTube for Tally Ho uh, and another uh, Alfred, um, Albert Strange uh, boat that's been restored in the US. So again, I got to meet Tim Lee, learn from him, pick up tips. Um, a constant in each of the trips down though to West Cork was Kevin O'Farrell. Um, Kevin O'Farrell, some people may know, he's a, a photojournalist uh, from, from the area. Every time you were down there, Kevin was there with his camera, taking pictures, quietly talking, having a chat, but just taking pictures. And that was kind of nice. It was interesting. Every now and again, he'd email me a picture. Um, so here's one of me down there working on the forward, forward companionway hatch, if I remember, um, or I me. Mean, that was, I think that was my first visit. Um, but Kevin was, was kind enough. Um, perhaps he was stuck for pages or something. I don't know, but essentially I, I, he honored me, I guess, by uh, popping me into one of his picture. I, I do feel somewhat of an imposter. Um, but it's nice to be there. It's nice to be there at the pages with, with all the greats from, from, from Hegarty's Boatyard. So <clears throat> what next? Where was I going to go next? Um, <clears throat> I wanted to do a boat. I wanted to make a boat, build a boat. Didn't really need one. Um, I, 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 clearly, I'd love to have built a kind of a 40-foot sail around the world. Didn't have, to have the space, the resources, the money, the time, but I just kind of wanted to do it. I, I popped in this quote, reason not the need. I, I didn't have a need for uh, a boat. I didn't need one, but I wanted to build one. Um, and before the talk, we were kind of talking a bit. Somebody mentioned it sometimes about the journey versus the destination. And for me, it is the journey. The destination will be what, what it is, where it is. Um, I just like doing it, I like making it. So I needed an excuse, didn't really have an excuse. Tom my old skipper who was here may not remember that he mentioned, oh, I think I fancy a, a bit of a rowboat on the Boyne. That was my excuse. I, I didn't care whether Tom meant it. Doesn't matter. I was, I'm making one now. If he doesn't want it, doesn't matter. And I, I don't think, in, Tom, you probably don't even remember that conversation, but it doesn't matter. Got the uh, Ian Uhtred, um, Uhtred drawings of Acorn, Acorn 15. Um, the drawings come and some instructions. I, I built it as a standing lug. Um, but, but going back to the first principles, um, I decided I was not going to use the detail that Ian puts in his drawing, that I was going to go back to first principles. I was going to draw it. I was going to loft it. Uh, so here's uh, a PDF of some of the lofting drawings. Um, I, I was lucky enough to have access to a, uh, an A0 plotter. still have it here beside me in the attic where I could draw uh, the line drawings from the table of offsets that Ian gives you, uh, draw the line drawings um, and, and draw from first principles the shape uh, and start building. So, so this is what I started with. Enjoyed the lofting process as much as anything else. Then it was time to start getting timber, start making things. Um, so some of the, uh, you can see here that I, I set up, uh, build upside down. I have the, uh, the molds here kind of a forward view of the moles. Um, it, it, it's a long time ago. It's literally 10 years nearly uh, that, that I started building this, 10 years ago that I started building it. I never have a, a, a kind of a completion date in any of my projects. Um, I work 
my, my kind of day-to-day -day nine to five job is project related. It's timeline related in, in my personal projects. There is no timeline. It's finished when it's finished. Um, so I've kind of forgotten a lot of the details, but so, some of the interesting things here in, in the drawings uh, for me was some of the, some of the issues and things I had to encounter at the time. Uh, my shed at home isn't very big. Um, I knew I was going to have to move this, what some people call a strong back, around from time to time. So I was concerned about as I moved it around to do other, other DIY projects that it was going. So I have holes you can see here that I'm pointing to in, in the frames. And it's probably not terribly clear, but you can kind of see the waterline lengths going across there. So those holes were almost like uh, crosshairs. So I could look through uh, and each hole was aligned up so that you could see through at least two holes and behind it, you'd see a crosshair of a water line. So you could kind of double check as you moved it around that uh, alignment stayed okay. It's kind of one of the interesting things. Ian's uh, <clears throat> boats are built, obviously they're glued, plywood, uh, clinker, lap strake. Um, you have an inner and an outer stem. This is where I laminated the inner and outer stem uh, around a, a kind of a form or a mold. Plenty of holes to strap it to it. So this is, you can see it here, it's strapped. Um, this transom is oak, uh, laminated knee for, for the back with a kind of an infiller. And then going back here, you have the uh, kind of keelstone. Some other pictures, um, we have the garboards. Um, I put on the planks left and right, left and right, left and right, so that I could kind of keep the planks lined up. Again, in Ian's drawings, he gives you the widths of the planks. I, I didn't use that. I went back to John Leather's book uh, to, and he describes how you line out and how you decide on the number of planks. So I kind of used that approach. <clears throat> I know in, in our WhatsApp chats with the old gaffers and Mark and, uh, and others, you can see plenty of packaging tape. I, I used Wexed epoxy. Uh, it's a messy business um, and I'm messy with it. So plenty of packaging tape there to uh, allow me to clean up and get away from it. Um, I don't know where I read it, but it, it, in one of the um, uh, books that I read or, or conversations that I had about boat building, somebody said to me, you can never have enough planks, uh, or not planks, but clamps. And that's true. Um, my shed now has Loads of planks, loads of clamps. Um, this picture here is kind of a, an interesting one. Um, so I'm getting close to being finished, obviously, but I, I have a picture of how I was laying out the planks. So this is my kind of uh, spiling batten. I have it clamped on. <clears throat> I was using uh, kind of a, a dividers or a compass to try and lay it out here uh, onto, onto my plank stock. Um, the plank stock is, is um, marine ply, six mil, not the best marine ply in the world. It's not Robin's Elite or anything like that, but it's better than Chadwick's, but probably closer to Chadwick's quality than, than Robin's Elite quality. Um, um, in some of the boat building books, you'll see lovely mouse shaped type lead weights. In, in my shed, I use just paving brick. It works. Um, so that's kind of the process of, of marking out a plank, laying it out, cutting it, and um, in a drawing that I think, I think I've missed. No, actually it's in another one. Um, you can see then that the plank fitting. Um, so in, in the center drawing you hear, uh, I used uh, plywood sort of, I'm not sure what you call them, but they were essentially clamps. And you can see some of the clothes pegs stolen from the clothesline, wooden clothes pegs that are effectively causing, uh, uh, giving me a clamping force along, along the glue joint along there. So each plank that went on uh, took a lot of those to glue it. By and large, it took me about a night, full night to uh, kind of measure and shape a plank. And, you know, probably another evening to, to glue the plank. I wasn't working night on night. I would do a plank maybe one week and perhaps do another plank next week. It, there was no deadline, there was no end game in sight. Um, you can see where uh, I was gluing here. Um, <clears throat> on, on a serious note with boats, um, it's all about quality. You, you know, you're on the water, you need, you need to be safe. Um, so, so we had inspections. Um, we had inspections by the Board of Trade. Um, and just like the old days of the customs inspections, sometimes there was ways and means of getting through the inspections. 
So in our house, we had regular inspections by, by the authorities of the matter. Um, but we were able to get through the inspections uh, with, with plenty of jellies, plenty of sweets, and it all worked. Usually the inspections went well and everything was okay to proceed. It's also, I suppose these drawings for me show me that um, it was a kind of a kid's thing, family thing. Uh, some nights I'd go out to work and I'd get nothing done because somebody would come out, we'd have a chat, we'd, drink, we'd eat jellies. Carrying on, getting close to the, some of the finishing pictures. Um, so, so this one here for me is kind of an, a nice one that it shows the evenness of the planks. I remember looking at this type of picture or another picture and kind of being happy that all the plank lands pretty much lined up, so it was good. Um, you can never have enough clamps, but ratchet straps are handy too. And um, this is where we're, I was gluing the outer stem to, to, to the boat. Um, the transom cleaned up, but not fully shaped here. Um, we're getting close, but at some point the boat has to come out of the shed and greet the world. And, uh, and here it is, kind of in its raw state, come out of its molds. Um, I had some of the rubbing strike on and, uh, and the cap rail, and I'd shaped the, the, the stem and such. Um, I like this picture. Um, every now and again, I'll look at it and stare at it and say, wow, that's a nice job. Um, the keen eye might see the eye imperfection. If you do, I'll declare it's just a problem with the lens of the camera. Um, but yeah, no, I'm happy with, happy with that. Everything's good. Painting, um, Daryl will recognize this. It's ivory, top, uh, top black. Not the same tin that you use, Daryl, but, but that, that's the color I painted. Um, interior wise, uh, the, tr the twarts are um, uh, large, um, large, uh, and then the, the floors is large, transoms oak. Oak kind of along the cap rail. Um, but anyway, uh, you'll also see in terms of timeline, I said the timeline here isn't, isn't uh, matching. So you can see the fleet of boats that I've started to build in my garden, including playhouses. But behind us here is um, the pirate ship that we built. Um, so the pirate ship is uh, built out of two sheets of 12 mil marine ply. It is a, it is a cross tree or um, a yard, uh, a bit of a deck and... As the kids were of a certain age, there was plenty of snacks and um, picnics on, on the boat. Uh, and even, even spinnakers got to fly from that. You can also see, Ben, you can see Ariel in the background there um, in its uh, early stage. So, so my projects overlap. That's kind of how it works sometimes with me. Um, like everything else, you have to do trials. So we started with sea trials. So the Board of Trade, again, came out and made sure that everything was good. So we ran some sea, sea trials on the grass. Um, so you can see that it's a, uh, we have to sail up, we, we row oars and everything, everybody is happy. I have a little uh, uh, launching trolley of source that sits nicely up into the centre board trunk. Sea trials passed by the Board of Trade. <clears throat> we had to do, or sorry, grass trials, now we're on to sea trials. So here's the day it was launched in Greystones Harbour. You can see uh, another adventure in the background, the, the boat yard. Um, but we also have this little trailer or trolley also fits on a laser trolley that I have, or laser road trailer, I should say. <clears throat> so the boat came to Cahor in Wexford um, um, uh, to have its trials in, in, in the sunny southeast, but more importantly, to have fun. So in the beach in Cahor, it would be anchored off a little bit, uh, wetsuits donned, jump in, climb in, jump in, climb out, get wet, have fun. So that's, that's kind of acorn, um, the first boat. Um, it, it, we still have it, uh, pride of place. Um, uh, my oldest boy, Donald, who's online as well, um, he, his project now is to finish the boat uh, and put on, remake the, uh, uh, the, the rudder, tiller, um, so that we can just do some further sea trials with, with our standing logs. So um, every day is a learning day in our house. Uh, every, everything's an opportunity to learn. Acorn. <clears throat> so next chapter. Um, I have a couple of things here. So um, the quotes, you can, you can read, read them there initially, but um, Greystones had a harbour now um, at this point, the year I, I've forgotten. Um, and Tom rang me one day. He said, I was thinking of coming down. Could, could I anchor overnight in the harbour? What do you think? 
the marina wasn't open um with kind of the access to the marina was had a chain on it uh monty was the harbor master at the time gordon monty hunter rang him said was thinking this guy coming down an old skipper what you think it was agreed yeah why not come on down tom arrived we he anchored in the harbor we went for dinner that night uh tom met monty and in true irish style it turns out monty and and and, and tom's brother knew each other so there was stories to be shared um but the following day the following day we were uh destined or planned to uh travel back to Hoth with tom and his wife rosemary uh, and have a bit of fun perhaps go via ireland's eye um we met up kids arrived on the boat they were like puppies in in, in somebody's house they were lifting hatches opening doors rooting around doing what kids do um, while this was happening, Tom, I don't know if you if you remember Tom, but you, you you huddled myself and Elaine in the cockpit and said, kind of almost, I wasn't sure whether you were going to give out about the kids or not, but started off by, oh, the kids are great, you know. Um, but then he started saying, now make sure you get your kids involved in sailing. Do you know, I, said, I, I never really did with, with my gang. And I said, yeah, but Tom, your kids came sailing with us. Like he said, no, no, no. He says, our kids came racing with us. That's the difference. He said. Your kids don't want to hear adults shouting at each other. He said, just go racing. But like, it won't take too long before they don't want to know you. But between this and then, have fun with them. And as Tom was delivering this kind of skipper's orders, as it were, um, there was somebody launching a uh, draftscom down the slip in Greystones. And he points over, he said, now look, get one of them. Make sure it's full of sweets. Have fun. Get wet. Act the maggot. So that's kind of where the quote comes from. That that set myself in a lane thinking yeah maybe it's about time maybe we should do something i, I tried this other one in that i've recently seen on on a on a sport ireland uh, piece about about competition versus versus fun um the article itself is about uh teenage girls in sport but uh, the punchline is um you know sport i suppose is mostly competitive but but the fun seems to get lost sometimes so that's kind of a mantra that, that I've sort of kept, or at least that I've evolved and I've seen this quote kind of back it up. So we were on a search. What would the next boat be? Um, taught about things like Drascom Luggers, um, taught about uh, even a Caribbean 21, a nice lined fin keeler. Ellen MacArthur sailed around the world in one, or not the world, but Ireland, uh, the UK in one. Um, uh, what else did I think of? Think of? I thought about a Drascom itself. But what happened was, uh, as sometimes it does, uh, Sean, Sean Walsh was on Seascapes talking about his boat, uh, Tiernanog of Hoth, and talking about how it was a herd built boat and how they were so uh, sea kindly, as, as he put it. And I said, oh, actually, yeah, herds, never thought about that. Um, I was aware of two can do, as we spoke about earlier. Um, I said, yeah, maybe, actually, let's go looking. So Paula Duck had this picture uh, on it. Uh, it was aerial of of Newcastle at the time, um, yeah, based in New Newcastle County Down. Um, forgotten the owner's name. Um, but a visit was arranged to up and have a look. Um, cosmetically, the boat was in great shape. He, he kept it in good shape. The, the, the mast, the spars, the, you know, the gaff, the, 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 uh, the, the bowsprit, everything was in perfect shape. Some of the uh, other uh, non-structural stuff like, well, structural-ish, like the floors, the cockpit sole, et cetera, was pretty much past its kind of life. It was a 30-year-old boat. It needed a bit of work. Um, sometimes with me, it's eyes wide shut. Eyes wide shut, uh, a deal was struck. Uh, Ariel arrived home. I, I knew there was going to be plenty of work, but it didn't matter. It was a project with no real deadline. The DIY experience was, was, was part of the journey. Um, Ariel arrived home on truck. On the truck, um, here it is with the dogs making sure everything was good. There's a lot of inspections in our house. Um, waiting the refit. So I, I put a large tarp over the boat. Um, again, made sure there was jellies and what we now call sucky sweets in our house. Um, sucky sweets are Lidl's uh, butterscotch sweets. So they're a staple on all our boats now, sucky sweets. Um, can't beat a bit of sugar. Um, but it was a family thing. Um, uh, just like building Ariel, some nights I got no work done that I might have climbed out to the boat. There was a light in it. Um, um, 
but one of the kids would arrive and we'd have to have a chat. Um, but some of the things that was, was had to be done, the, 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 um, the ballast in aerial, uh, if I remember, is about 700 kilos of, of and, and Ben knows all about this because uh, we organized the shipment of it in, a, in an IBC, and I think Ben painted it, but all sorts of horribleness of rusty iron and everything messing. You can see that the, um, the, the, the floors, the floorboards were well uh, past or sell by date. This is the, obviously the cockpit sole taken out. Um, the forward bulkhead was, uh, wasn't in bad shape, but I kind of saw as was the, the aft shape. But while I was doing stuff, I kept going. Um, um, I, I started layering it up. Essentially, I used um, 18 mil uh, marine ply in a kind of an I-beam type uh, format. So I, I have a, an Oroco top and Oroco bottom. So that was kind of my I-beam shape. And this is one of the floors before it actually got glued in. Um, I glued it in with quite a generous uh, epoxy, West epoxy fillet, thickened with uh, colloidal silica, if I remember. Um, but not only that, uh, knowing that the previous, uh, it was an open boat, it was going to take water either from, from the rain or other. I wrapped the bottom of these uh, uh, floorboards in glass cloth and, and epoxy, almost hermetically sealed them so that <clears throat> while it was marine ply and oak, Oroco that I kind of felt comfortable it was probably going to outlast me or, 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 or at least last another 30 years. So, so this is the kind of the, the beginnings of the floor setup. I put in a new aft, uh, aft um, bulkhead with a little hatch where we ha have some storage of stuff that's um, a red deal type tongued and groove sheeting on top of marine ply. The deck itself, or the cockpit sole itself, um, is again 18 mil marine ply, sealed with epoxy on the underside. But on the top, for mechanical strength, I guess, and wear and tear, I put down um, fiberglass matting, uh, epoxy resin, and peel ply. I don't know if anybody's used peel ply, but wonderful stuff. Um, other things that needed to be done. The boat originally had uh, a cutout for a, uh, a prop that was sealed very soon after it was commissioned. I was commissioned by a guy called Chris Libby in, in, uh, in Falmouth, um, moved from there to Swanwick. But uh, Chris, through social media or other, it was, I think it was Facebook, made contact with me and gave me some of the stories behind fitting this. And he also fitted uh, what he called a, 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 a heel extension. I'm not sure if that's the correct term, but good enough for me. Um, he, he felt that originally when it was commissioned it didn't have great windward performance so he felt that this heel extension improved the windward performance and um so i had to it was some form of deal or pine or something i'm not sure what it was it wasn't in great shape when i took it off then i had i exposed uh, where where that so i layered it all up that's a roco again uh, bonded uh, wrapped up in glass cloth and and sealed um, Myself and Ben, who now, uh, or these two bought the boat from me, have had ongoing discussions about uh, the windward performance of, of aerial, but also its tacking ability. Um, I found it wasn't the most responsive tacking. I kind of felt that the bottom part of, of the rudder maybe lacked a bit of volume, and or th there was a gap between the leading edge of the rudder and the trailing edge of, of, the, of the stern that maybe was causing water, um, the water flow not to flow that well in, in attack. Um, ben has since remedied that. Um, I know he has a quite a large, generous underwater profile to the rudder and reliably tells me that the, uh, its tacking ability is much improved. Um, Ariel had a, had a keel band. Um, you can see here it was rust, rust heavily rusted. Um, <clears throat> but interestingly enough, it, it was uh, bolted to the hull and uh, bedded in Denso tape. I don't know if anybody uses Denso tape. Again, horrible sticky stuff. Um, but when I took it off, the, like 30 years later, the Denso tape was, wasn't in bad shape at all. Um, there was a backing plate on the inside of the hull. So you had the uh, keel band, um, stainless steel eight mil bolts, if I recall, and a backing plate. Again, the whole backing plate was wrapped in Denso tape. 
And again, the underside of that, the non-exposed side of that, the Denza tape was in, in, in good shape. I opted to, to replace it in, um, in stainless steel, um, um, 316 stainless steel, I think four mil, maybe five mil, I don't remember. Shaped, I was able to get all the pieces off intact. So I, I was able to shape them to the original pieces, uh, bore them to the original holes. So therefore they went on very neat into the, I didn't have to bore any extra holes. It was bedded in um, um, Cicaflex. Um, and I kind of in a side story to, to the Cicaflex to the, uh, was myself and I'm not sure what age he was, but again, it was a family thing. I was myself and my son did, did the bonding of, of the Cicaflex. <clears throat> and what I can tell you about Cicaflex is that uh, acetone doesn't clean it off your hands. What it does is it makes it uh, look like that you have perfectly uh, smooth, white, almost surgical gloves on your hands that stay on for about two days. Um, some people in work still remind me of the day I come in with the white gloves on. It was kind of a weird one. Um, they eventually fell off. Fell off. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a there's kind of a lot of stories to, to this. So this, this is the rudder. Uh, the rudder was in good shape. I actually thought about rebuilding a new one completely, but when I stripped the rudder back itself, it was solid. I stripped it back completely, layered a little bit of glass cloth on it to give some kind of lateral uh, strength to it, put on new uh, rudder straps, bronze, um, I think the middle size uh, rudder straps. And um, I think as a result of Ben's exploits uh, crossing over to the Isle of Wight, he was kind of saying he was kind of glad to know that he had extra strong rudder straps on there. But the color, the co this is the more for me for this one is the color. Um, Ariel was black when I got it, um, didn't like black. Um, fancied a deep blue or a deep green, but I didn't know what. Um, I got a pack of, or a, a can of Donegal green from uh, International, I didn't like Donegal green. Got Mauritius blue, didn't really like that. I was kind of now getting close to having to decide on what I was going to paint the boat, but I didn't, couldn't decide on the color. Uh, in desperation, one evening, I mixed the two of them together, shook it up, and that's the color. So I call it the aerial green, but effectively, it's a mixture 50-50 of Mauritius blue and Donegal green from International. I, I liked it as a color. Um, it not, some people said it was actually blue, not green, which is kind of an interesting one, but uh, I still like it as a color. Everything comes to an end or everything uh, finishes up. So this is Ariel launched. Um, <clears throat> some of the stuff that I haven't spoken about is, is um, I, I put in a kind of a pin rail here. Um, uh, previously, because I'd taken out the forward bulkhead, um, I, uh, the, the pin rail was, was previously mounted to that. So now I needed somewhere. So I fashioned this <clears throat> kind of oak going across and I think the mahogany here and a number of, uh, ash pins that uh, uh, the father of a buddy in work uh, turned on the lathe. Uh, and it kind of, I don't know what Ben's thoughts are. I, I like the look of it. Sometimes in, 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 in the tack, um, the sheets snagged here a little bit, but I still liked the look of it. Um, so that was Ariel launched in May 2015 um, and awaiting some adventures. Um, Ariel, I'm, I'm, you know, boasting now, but I, I thought it really looked well. And so did most of the photographers in Greystones think it, it, it looked well. So uh, a friend, Alan Leddy, uh, and uh, a friend of a friend um, um, spotted it in various guises and took some, some wonderful photographs and probably helped uh, um, catch Ben's eye when, when he was selling it. And perhaps it'll catch somebody else's eye as the boat moves from one custodian to the other. Um, but those are some of the interesting pictures. Um, but then we had to have fun. It was for fun. Um, some, of the, some of the trips. So this is going to be a little bit like the family wedding shoot shot. So I'm going to move on fast. But uh, there's some, some interesting. Uh, my machine is going a bit slow. But some interesting uh, pictures to show the kind of fun that we had. Now, clearly, I've shown pictures where everybody's happy and not sad. But there weren't really too, there weren't not any sad times. And um, we now were in the position to be able to teach the kids how to sail. So, you know, here's our young man uh, skippering away. Perhaps there might be a finger on, on the tiller, just making sure everything was good. 
we took the opportunity to bring out friends of the family, have, have a bit of fun. There was always an opportunity for a selfie. Excuse me. One of the things I, I always liked about sailing was evening sailing, night sailing at night. Um, so grey stones is easy. Uh, you get lovely uh, uh, sunsets. So regularly, uh, I know my family and friends are tired of me sending them night pictures, sunset pictures, but that's one of them. Um, <clears throat> this is a, an interesting picture in a couple of reasons. It, it kind of shows the stability that a, a Ariel had. We were out in reasonably choppy weather there. Um, and well, everybody's supposed to be enjoying it. Yes, guys. But behind us here is uh, the Greystones Deface National Ensign. So it's kind of probably another story in its own right. But um, prior to luncheon, uh, Ariel, I, I was sailing secretary. Um, again, sparked by Tom telling me that the club needed a, a, an ensign. Um, I set on, on a path to try and register a, a, an ensign for the club, um, which involves visiting the Chief Herald of Ireland and the National Library, making representations to the IMO uh, um, and the Mercantile Marine Office. An interesting process that took about nine months, but I guess something that uh, will be uh, well in uh, left behind in Greystone Sailing Club, perhaps when, when, when I'm not a member. <clears throat> More fun. Um, <clears throat> I'll just go back one. We had to do a couple of raids to Docky Island. Um, so here's a picture of our fun times at Docky Island. We have a rubber duck, so we uh, took an opportunity to go up to Dunleary uh, and came home via, via picnic in Docky Island. <clears throat> um, uh, I, I also used the opportunity, and our, our oldest fella particularly was interested in, in the concept of navigation from reading Midshipman Fury books to Swallows and Amazons books. So here he is triangulating our position uh, off probably the sugar loaf or somewhere else. <clears throat> um, clearly, he's getting handy at sailing, um, uh, breezy enough and comfortable and happy and smiling. Um, of course, logs have to be kept. A staple of our, our trips was what we called the Mulditch cruise. Um, now, you could probably, well, a, a better swimmer than I could probably swim to the Mulditch, but it's not too far out. But when you're of a certain age, uh, a cruise to the Mulditch has, has its appeal to be celebrated with, with sucky sweets or whatever we have on board. Um, this is myself and Donal en route to the Gaffer's Regatta. Um, yeah, I can't remember what year. Uh, obviously passing by uh, uh, Dawkey Island. Um, all crews are, are, are happy when they're well fed. So Sweeney's in Greystones were always uh, willing to supply uh, the crew uh, and to be well fed. <clears throat> this one, it, it's not a very remarkable picture, but wh why is it there? Um, when I was wrestling with the concept of a boat and the price and the costs, uh, somebody said to me, just, you know what, one day, one day you'll go out and it'll be all worth it. Even, even, even if you just had to pay all the money for that day, you'll be happy. Now, while this isn't a remarkable picture, I do remember the day, and it was one of those days. Of course, we uh, more, more fun names. That's kind of the, the trip of, of Ariel. <clears throat> so, um, sorry, I have to go back. <clears throat> ben, when he was buying the, buying the boat, was telling me about his, his boat, Betty 2. Um, Betty 2, if anybody's interested in a beautiful boat, if you go on to my classic boat uh, in, on YouTube, you'll see Ben showing off his boat to uh, the, 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 uh, the classic, my classic boat YouTube. Um, but Ben was telling me about his concept, small boat, big adventure. Um, and, and I kind of agree with him. Um, so that's why I've thrown this quote in here. But <clears throat> for me at this point, uh, Ariel had done its job. Um, it, its job was to introduce the kids to sailing, get them to like sailing, and they did. It, it, it had worked. It's done its job. I, I kind of felt that the kids were kind of saying, oh, I'm going to go sailing with you. And I said, no, you have to go and do your own sailing. So in a fit of madness, perhaps I put Ariel up for sale. <clears throat> perhaps I was hoping that nobody would buy it, that it was an oddball thing. Who would want it anyway? Um, but I put it up for sale. And lo and behold, prior to Christmas, Ben Collins rang me, said he was interested, and not to get, not to, you know, let it go without him. Uh, in the in in the new year, Ben arrived over, a deal was struck, uh, and suddenly Ben owned the boat. Um, 
This allowed the kids, though, then to do their own thing. Now, the kids were still uh, devastated when I told them the, kid, the, the boat was for sale. And in the aftermath of the Beast from the East, we towed the boat down to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to Ross Lair, where it was popped on the ferry and Ben picked it up on the other side. And it was like towing the boat in a funeral cortege. The, the kids were silent. The closer we got to New Ross, the uh, tears appeared. Anyway. Kids went sailing. Um, they uh, now love, love sailing for different reasons. Um, <clears throat> Donald, my oldest, is hoping to compete in uh, the 4.7 Laser 4.7 Worlds in the Leary. Um, the girls um, are having fun. Anytime the girls go sailing, they say, "Can I capsize? Can I jump in?" And the answer, of course, is always yes, within the confines of, of some some of the safety aspects. But earlier, that done its job. But I needed something else. We needed eventually something else. What that was going to be, I, I, I didn't know at the time. Um, I looked at a number of different boats from <clears throat> traditional uh, Bermudans that might have a cabin that might be more actually a little bit more, um, a little bit more practical than, than, than perhaps what the next boat is. Um, the next boat, though, was an, a, a bigger sister to uh, Ariel. It's, it's a herd 23. Um, so between say smaller size to Sean's boat, um, <clears throat> I, I, I looked at a twenty eight. It was probably too big and a bit impractical. I was probably going to take on too much of a bigger DIY challenge than I was ready for. Um, <clears throat> with Sam Hurd's help, um, again I rang Sam on a few occasions when I do up aerial to ask him questions, and he was nice enough to answer and um, pick up the phone. But I was talking to him, I said, oh, I was kind of thinking of a 23, but do you know of any? I said, he didn't at the time, but about a fortnight later, he rang me and said, do you know what? There might be one that'll go for sale. It's here in the yard. It's not for sale yet, but I, I, think, they got, I think the fellas will sell it. Um, so I went over, I think in July of, of that year, had a look at it. It was in, I wouldn't say perfect shape, uh, <clears throat> structurally absolutely sound. It had been refit a number of years prior had been sitting in, in his yard. The varnish was a bit tired. <clears throat> but an interesting thing, obviously the name appealed to me, but the, the thing that kind of appealed to me most was um, um, Kelt was built for the Roseland Trust. And I haven't been able to find too much information on the Roseland Trust. <clears throat> it, 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 since, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was an outreach uh, thing for some <clears throat> youths of the area to get them involved in sailing, to kind of teach them <clears throat> kind of like a youth club, I think. So I kind of interested me. Um, it was now owned by, I think, two gentlemen who raced it for a bit um, and then had, had it parked up in Sam's yard and weren't sure whether they were going to sell it or not. Um, but uh, prior to Christmas uh, in 2018, Sam rang me and said, you know what, it's up for sale. We still want it. And well, the logistics were organized. Uh, Kelch arrived home <clears throat> with uh, Jonathan Kennedy. Um, there is Kel sitting in, in Sam's yard and then coming in on the boat and coming in on the, on, on the trailer. <clears throat> um, this time <clears throat> it was in the uh, Greystones um, uh, boatyard. Um, so we parked it up there, put, it, put the usual uh, cockpit tent over it brought all the tools down, sucky sweets, obligatory to keep the crew happy. Um, and we just got stuck in. Uh, the kids helped a lot. They were now older, they were able to. So from sanding, varnishing, scraping, whatever, it was it was all hands on deck. Um, <clears throat> I, I won't go into too much details on it because there wasn't much to do with scraping and varnishing, and that was it. Um, took a bit of time, life gets in the way, but... Um, so here is Kelt the day before it was launched, ready to be launched, <clears throat> uh, sitting in the yard waiting for the crane to pick it up. Um, interesting thing uh, on this, and there's further pictures that we'll see, is <clears throat> on the end of the tiller there was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a Prince of Wales uh, feather, but it was, uh, it was a twopence, the other side of a twopence, that was deteriorating. So I got the brass uh, plate made up, which I think looks kind of nice. Um, <clears throat> yes, there's a fender in the water. Uh, so this is Kelt as it, as it was launched, um, you know, minutes after it was launched and the cameras come out. More stuff to be done. The bowsprit isn't fitted and sails aren't bent on, but that's just a picture of it. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, <clears throat> so quick kind of showreel of some of the adventures we've had. We've only had Celt for really a, a half season and a COVID season or a pandemic season. So we haven't got as much as perhaps we'd like to do, but we've, we've had fun nonetheless, and it's, it's been good. Um, clearly the kids are now older, they're getting good, we're, we're having fun. Uh, here's Celt with, with Ailish, our youngest, on the, on, on the tiller. I didn't have the bowsprit on um, at the time. And as we all know, boat uh, sailing is about balance and for sure. A, um, a gaff rig boat of Celts with big, big main on it needs the, the, the jib out front to keep the balance. Of it. Happy crew is a fed crew. So we have, we've had some picnics and had a bit of crack. Um, <clears throat> a bit of sailing, some nice uh, stuff, a bit of brass. Can't be a bit of brass. Um, excuse me. So there's the picture of, of the uh, uh, Celtic spiral. And, uh, I kind of like it every now and again. Look at it more like that. Um, we've had Christmas Day trips. We've had all sorts of trips. Um, with COVID restrictions, uh, not a huge pile. Celt has a small, more than a cuddy, uh, <clears throat> folks of type where one person can, could sleep comfortably and with the loo cloth and such like. Um, <clears throat> might extend it to make it a bit more room. Um, and, you know, relax. And it's all about just relaxing and staring sometimes. Um, I think that I can't remember when the last picture was, and then that's the picture that you've seen on 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 the uh, on the flyer. Um, I actually enjoy sailing uh, single handed, um, not throughout through any antisocial piece. Um, <clears throat> I just enjoy it. you're busy, um, and sometimes it's a grand way of relaxing and think of, thinking about nothing else. So again, small boat, big adventure. <clears throat> um, so what's next? Um, I, through uh, Cunningham Covers, I got the uh, boom tent fashioned. We perhaps tend to go a bit mad and do a bit of camping in there. Um, <clears throat> I threw in the Irish Sea map that, you know, we might go a bit north, south, east or west. Who knows where we'll go. Um, but the intent is to do a bit of, bit of longer cruising when, when, when COVID restrictions allow us to, to go that further. Um, who knows what we'll do? Watch the space. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to change tack subject a little bit at the, uh, for the next one. And um, so I brought you through, uh, you know, what brought me to sailing um, and, and why I got into certain types of boats <clears throat> and, and where to next. But I, I've always had the view, I remember hearing it when, when we used to watch incessantly uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, the Jack Sparrow quote uh, to Mr. Mr. Gibbs, uh, take what you can, give nothing back. But I always kind of said, actually, do you know what? Take what you can, give something back. Um, so that's kind of sort of been my mantra. Uh, you know, you go sailing with somebody, you try and help with maintenance. <clears throat> Myself and Tom had plenty of maintenance activities and had good fun with it. Um, I also read an article uh, by Tom Cliff about Pass It On, <clears throat> which was kind of uh, nice about giving something back. So where am I going with this? Um, Greystone Sailing Club, uh, where the kids are involved in junior sailing. Um, <clears throat> in the junior sailing, it's, it's a kind of a wonderful uh, 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 wave, a peak wave, uh, you know, kind of a spring tide of kids coming through. Um, where on Sundays, <clears throat> led by, by Tony, who I think is online, um, where the emphasis is on fun. We, we take kids from eight-ish to ten to a bit more, where <clears throat> clearly boating is a bit dangerous. It has its risks. You, you need to keep them safe. Uh, you need to make sure they have fun. <clears throat> a successful day in Greystone's Sunday sailing was when the kids come back up the slips smiling. Uh, uh, an ultimate success day is to come back up smiling, declaring that they'll be here next week. Um, as they get older, competition and competitors might kick in, but from a kind of an eight to 14-year-old kind of it's all about fun and um, what's become evident though is there's no snowflakes and gray stones um the juniors the current uh, wave of juniors and even previous uh because we've a <clears throat> an under 25 program where some of the some of the older crew are essentially restoring a j24 for the uh under 25 uh racing stuff 
Um, <clears throat> but it struck me that the, the juniors in the club, and, and it became evident and unprompted, the juniors, the, the older juniors, the kind of 14, 16, 17 year olds, started to volunteer to do work on your, on your Sunday. Do work, I mean, uh, help with safety duties. Uh, help the, un the younger gang rig their boat, perhaps go out sailing with the younger gang. And nobody asked him to do this. It was like, Jesus, look at this. This is what they're doing. This is wonderful. Take what you can, give something back, being the mantra. Uh, I kind of said, we have to recognize this. Uh, we have to give something back. What, what is that? So myself and Tony started talking over coffees and the like. Um, in parallel, I, I, I became aware of uh, the Gashka. <clears throat> now, not everybody will know what the Gashka is in Ireland. Um, the Gashka is, is the president's award, similar to the Duke of uh, Edinburgh's award in, in, in the UK. Um, so the, the Gashka award is a kind of a personal uh, challenge issued by the president of Ireland. So I said, wouldn't it be nice to be able to include recognition, recognition outside of the club uh, for the work that they're doing, or volunteerism that they're doing in the club? Myself and Daryl have been talking about this, and that's probably why you press ganged me into this talk perhaps but uh it, it's still worth telling or giving you the story of where we think we might go with gashka so what is gashka <clears throat> and I, I won't dwell on it but it's essentially a challenge from the president of ireland to the young people of ireland uh, 15 to 25 and um, to take on a, a challenge challenge yourself to grow confidence uh, get experience get new opportunities and guess what happened for me um so within the sailing club, the sailing club has recently applied to become a challenge partner uh, through Gashka. And then you, you also have PALS, which are President of the Award leaders, of which I'm halfway through that process of becoming a, been, just need to do a, the training next Thursday, if I remember. Um, <clears throat> but it's about uh, community involvement, give something back. Um, in the sailing club terms, it's about recognizing what the juniors currently are given back to the club, recognizing we're more than that. Um, physical education uh, isn't, isn't uh, sailing a good physical recreation, why not? Um, sometimes in, in, in any club, kids come down and go sailing, but if we can reward them for coming back, particularly in the early stages where before the competitiveness that kicks in and, and ultimately will kick in, that we can reward them for coming down and have fun uh, and recognize that physical education or uh, recreation and um, develop a personal skill um, obviously that could be anything and, and that can be anything that that the Gashka participants wants to do so long as it was in certain boundaries but one thing that struck me is that we could do is introduce uh, the concept of seamanship uh, navigation to to the juniors in a very basic level um, that will be something essentially a skill that they will have perhaps for the rest of their life and then there's an adventure journey. What, what kid doesn't want an adventure journey? It depends on the level you're doing. It's kind of a two day, one night type adventure journey or the kids do a long hike. So it struck me and, and Tony who's, who's online, I think did a similar journey with his, uh, his son last year where they, for instance, went from Greystones to uh, uh, Dunleary via the Kishon Hoke. Um, in an adventure journey in one of the days and, and reciprocal down via Wicklow and back the next day. Um, so it struck me that we in the sailing club could do something like that as well. So <clears throat> I know I'm off piste about the boats, but I'm trying to sell a message and perhaps get some ideas from, from other sailing, sailing communities of what, what, what it might do. With that in mind, I suppose we're all aware of the press gang squads. Um, so <laughs> tongue-in-cheek of sorts, I'm saying beware of the press, press gang. Um, I have been known to, 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 to badger people and elbow my way into things. So I'm kind of asking for ideas. Um, and I suppose, <clears throat> um, particularly in, in, in the gaff-rigged world um, of traditional sailing, where there's any amount of bits of string and rope to pull, um, there's two head sails typically, there's loads to do. Um, Sometimes on a boat, you go out with the skipper and you're sitting there. Now, what do I do? But anybody who comes out with, with me, um, 
I seldom take the tiller. I, I don't need to take the tiller. I'm just happy enough. So everybody, everybody gets a job. I'm just happy for it to be out there. So it struck me that gaff rig boats lends itself to that. So, so do Bermudans, of course, but uh, it's stuff that we could do, something that the OGA could do, not necessarily for the Greystone Sailing Club, for any club that uh, each of us are, are affiliated with, just that you could introduce and build essentially what is a life skill for, for the juniors as, as, as they go into in, uh, throughout their life. And wherever they find themselves in the world, they can give something back. Take what you can, give something back. So that's me. Um, <clears throat> obviously, it's in the support of the RLI, so obviously give off them and give plenty. So I hope I haven't lost too many of you. Um, but that, that's, that's my talk for tonight, at least. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for a, an adventurous journey through your boat owning career. One thing that stuck to my mind was the fact that you brought your children with you all along the way and you still have them. Most times, I think uh, the children are inclined to drift off, particularly if there's so much work to be done on a boat. You know, on the bigger boats, you have an awful lot of work and uh, it's probably 60 or 70 percent work and 30 percent sailing. And I love this 30 percent sailing. 10% of it is great, and the other 20% is either storms, gale, or hardship, or no wind. But uh, you've managed to keep them on board, and it's uh, an example to us all how to keep young people uh, fully occupied when they're on board. And thank you very much for a very enlightening evening. Thank yeah, you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Joe. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Th thoroughly enjoyed that an oh, education course. for me. Um, as, as a man new to all of this business, I was uh, thoroughly educated. Very interesting indeed. Thank you. Uh, hi, it's uh, Steve Lorraine here. I'm on board Aeolus, in fact, just opposite um, Mylar. I'm on, on board the boat tonight. It's seven degrees outside and 25 degrees inside. I really enjoyed the talk. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're a lucky man. Say <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hey, hi to Sam if you see him. So, Joe, can you hear me, Joe? I can indeed. So this is Ben Collins here from uh, from uh, Southern England, Lymington. It was interesting to hear your story about uh, taking uh, Ariel down to the ferry to come yeah. over to uh, to Wales. Just wanted to say that was the, definitely very cold weather because it's. I went to pick her up in Fishguard and uh, you. <laughs> we couldn't find her. I didn't tell you this story. You know, she'd been offloaded and uh, fish guard was abandoned because of the weather. And we had trailed this, a friend of mine had to four by four, we, a Land Rover, we trailed it a low loader because the trailer, we were worried about doing the 200 miles from fish guard back to Lymington. So we got to fish guard. I don't know if you want to hear this story. I'll try and be quick, but it's quite amusing. And it started to, it was, it was snow everywhere. And when we, when we, we, we rolled up, to, to, there was nobody around, nobody. So we looked and we looked, and then we eventually came across a guy who was in a shed. And I said, have you seen this a boat? You know, where do they offload the stuff for the ferry? And he, he said, well, they usually put it over there. And he kind of pointed into this bleak corner of the, uh, of the big, it's a big port. There's a lot of parking space and nothing much in it. And there she was. And... I said, well, can I just take her? You know, I mean, do you want any evidence? I mean, I'm going to be stealing this boat. Anyway, we managed to we managed to crank her on to the to the to the boat, and then on our way back, there was an accident in, on one of the main roads, so we had to turn off into a country lanes, and it was there was a lot of snow around, and it, oh, I just thought we're never going to get home. Uh, in the end, we we had to stay in a hotel, and the next day we we got it back. Um, but uh, that was quite an adventure. I shall never forget that. Yeah. Never forget that because of the weather. And it was that it was that time when the Novichok thing had happened in Salisbury, and that was the other part of it. We we couldn't take the trailer back because um, Salisbury was locked down, and that's where I had hired it. Okay. So we had to keep this trailer locked in my front drive until such time as we were allowed back in, you know. So it was a big adventure there. But I wanted to just, I, I, I think I've sent you a picture of the rudder. I just wanted to just quickly, and I'll finish there because it's not my, um, I think I've sent it to you by on, on the I'll, big I'll rudder. Yeah. You got it there? 
I have, yeah. Let's see if how well it'll come true. Can you um, can you send that on? The, put that up, and I don't know. Anyway, the point is, you're right. She wouldn't go about very well. And in, in, in the Solent, it, it, we have what we call the Solent chop, which is short, sharp, very strong currents and very short seas. And I had real trouble getting her to go about. Um, so I had a friend of mine who's a boat builder make a bigger rudder. Um, and uh, that's what we did. And it was a lot better. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm looking at it here. I'm, I'm not sure how to get it onto. Well, you can probably hold your camera up to the camera. Can you, it, uh, can you come right closer? Closer? Yeah, it's a nice, it's a much bigger rudder than. Oh, yeah, very much so. Yeah. That's fine, yeah. That's it. And were you able to marry up the, the aerial green? No. You, you had the, you had the I, haven't, I, you, I haven't painted her yet. Although oh, okay. I, okay. It's getting to the point where she's beginning to yeah. chip a bit. Yeah. But no, I haven't. And yeah, you have the form, the trademark. To, um, the only other thing that you used to do is I found your pin rail. I used to, because mine's on a, a, a mooring as opposed to a tied in a marina, to lean forward to grab the boy. I kind of Gets ended up way, with a yeah. bit of rib damage so yeah it didn't take her away but i reduced the number of pins yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh yeah anyway yeah. that's and yeah thank finished. you for thank you for that it was very interesting to hear you and i appreciate now what you did as well because uh, she's a very well reinforced boat with a very good floor i always used to think wow this has lasted a long time i didn't realize that you'd rebuilt it yeah, yeah, yeah. From from and and just obviously, you know, it's oh, it was probably not going to last forever. But I, I, I there's plenty of epoxy in there. Um, yeah, I kind of, I, I kind of shudder to to remember the amount of epoxy I ended up buying from Viking Marine in Dunleary. And I took all the ballast out, and it killed me. Yeah, yeah. 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 I put it all. I painted it and put it all back in. Seven hundred and fifty kgs of awfulness. Yeah, I couldn't believe. <laughs> Yeah. Joe, it's Alan here. Just a quick question. Have you any thoughts on your next project? Mm. Um, we know there's one in there somewhere. Uh, there's always a project. Just this. Um, um, it, it's it's as I said, in the, I, I know you you came late. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I um I never know where I'm going next. It, it's it's the journey. It's the destination. Where is wherever wherever the heck I land. Who knows what project will come my way. And uh, as you well know, Alan, there's all this stuff in my shed and in my garden on the project. I say hello to Sean Walsh. Sean? Sean, how are you keeping? Yeah, hello, hello, Joe. That was a terrific talk. <coughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I hope uh, this year you'll come to Dublin Bay and give Tiernanog a hard time. We, 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 we certainly are planning to it. Um, uh, do it. I, I know Alan, who has just spoke, uh, doesn't realise it just yet, but he's been press ganged into the crew, uh, along naturally with some of the family. Um, but it's probably your fault, Sean, that I do have a herd boat, because number one, I'm not sure if you heard me, but um, it was your talk on seascapes to talk to when you were talking about Tiernanog a number of years ago, if you remember. Um, yeah. That's, oh yeah, herds, I, I remember then. <clears throat> but like a lot of things I do, I never tried sailing a herd before. I just thought, oh, I'll give it a go. Um, but it, it, my first time sailing on, on a herd boat was with yourself in, in the Gaffer's Regatta at the time you had your foot in a, in a cast, if you may remember. I think, Mark, you were on the crew at the time. We had a, a wonderful day that time. In, in substantial breeze, if I remember. And I remember uh, we, we jibed at the turning mark, um, went off down in a rage downwind and it was like Moses parting the sea with with is it six tons or nine tons that the uh, um Tiernanog is but we just had such a stable run down from that towards the finish line at Pool Bag. I remember being so impressed with it. Thank you. It was a great a great time and uh, it was lovely to hear Ben there. Ben served with distinction our, our general management committee when I was president. <laughs> and uh, a great guy to have aboard. Hello, Nolene. Uh, Hello, uh, great to see you all. Great to see you all. Great Thanks. to see you. <laughs> You're very brave. <laughs> good to see you, Sean. Very good to see you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Good to see you too. Uh, and uh, it's a small world, isn't it, that you bought an Irish boat? <laughs> indeed, indeed. And uh, probably partly inspired by you as well, I think, because the herd is a very nice boat and it's a good, it's a good breed. Well, it's, um, 
It's a board of choice for presidents because three presidents have sailed for 28 and out. At least just three, and you won't be coming after me. That's okay. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Thank you, guys. I'm going to sign and off. Take care of yourself, Sean. Okay, Speedy Sean. recovery. Oh, Sean. God bless. Thank oh, you. Uh, Joe, can you hear me? I can indeed. Joe, it's Dave Lewis. Um, I just wanted to reflect on a couple of things that you said. Uh, a, I'm totally impressed with your uh, boat building skills and the whole thing. But coming to the, the thing about um, kids and involvement in sailing, as an impecunious kid on the beach at home where I grew up, um, I was lucky enough to be able to crew dinghies and get into sailing. Um, it's much harder these days. And one thing that um, I came across, I, um, I took a, a lady friend and her kids to the Isle of Wight to sea view on holiday and I took a, a mirror on top of the car and we sailed it there. But I learned from the Sea View Yacht Club that um, they sell Sea View One designs and they, uh, they encourage the kids to, to learn in those boats, which are traditional well-found clinker boats complete with anchors and oars and the whole nine yards. Um, but the, the young kids crew, um, but when they become older, and competent, they are sent off by the club to learn to be instructors. And they come back and they learn, they teach the younger kids. And I thought that was a rather wonderful way of sort of perpetuating the cycle. And I don't know what the equivalent might be in sort of Greystones or somewhere, but um, the idea um, seems like a good one because otherwise to go to a sort of a sailing school and take an RYA course, which is what it seems to take these days is, out of the reach of a lot of kids. Yeah, no, it is. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Greystone Sailing Club has, has a, a very strong tradition of training in general, uh, obviously uh, aligned with the ISA. Um, um, <clears throat> in terms of a part of history, I mean, Greystones has produced uh, world champions, world record holders. Uh, last year, Pamela Lee and her, her co-skipper, Cat, if I remember her name, um, took a world record uh, around sailing around Ireland uh, two-handed in, in a female in a, in a Figaro true. Um, we have Olympians, we have world champions, we have national champions, uh, we have um, international judges with uh, Jack Roy, for example. Um, but the club gives, gives a huge amount back. It's a small club. Um, so uh, this year we have... <clears throat> Our training course is hopefully uh, pandemic and allowing, but um, we always have a program of, of bringing the next wave of juniors that aren't yet instructors and bringing them in as, as uh, assistant instructors. So, for instance, a, a number of, of 15, 16 year olds uh, <clears throat> joining, if you like, uh, the, the ranks of the, uh, of the workers to, to do that. And, and then as, as it goes up the ranks, there's a very strong uh, uh, coaching uh, ethos uh, for people who, who, who are very strong racers in their own right to, to, to drive that uh, uh, sailing down. Um, for, for me, I'm not trying to, if you like, uh, get in the way of that. I mean, I'm just trying to or look at another way of recognizing the effort, the volunteerism. I suppose all of us love a bit of recognition, you know, give me a pat on the back. I think, you know, I'm happy enough and I'll, I'll do more. Um, but the club does have a very strong tradition of, of like our senior instructor who, who, will, who will be the kind of, if you like, the, the lead instructor for the training this year is a club member. Uh, he grew up in the ranks of the club and he's, he, he's now himself uh, uh, gone to the level of be, becoming senior instructor. Uh, and that's important for, for that level of recognition. So it, it, it is within the club and hopefully we'll build more and it'll get stronger and stronger. It's lovely to be able to have it self-sustaining um so my my perhaps naive thoughts on on, on the gashka and, and the president's award thing is that as we introduce it uh, to like the 16 year olds that who will be doing their bronze award um they might be able to help the next wave when they're older and perhaps competing for their silver uh, award and, and laterally later on for their gold award that they can as I say, take what you can, but, but give something back. So take what you can in terms of take any opportunity to learn, to go sailing, to gain a skill, but also give something back. So that, that's kind of what 
I suppose that's the message I'm trying to sell here. No, I, I, I totally applaud that. Um, and, uh, you know, any way one can contribute to that. I think yeah, and right. we'll give it a blast and see what happens. Uh, you, you don't know without trying it. But it sounds like Greystones are very well organised already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we do have a couple of the members of the club, and uh, I know Tony's. Uh, um, I can't remember who else is on the line looking at the, at the thing. But yeah, no, it is very well organised. Good ethos. Um, very, very strong view of safety, but strong view of, particularly in the younger ages, uh, just go and have fun, get wet, act the maggot, uh, but we'll keep you safe. Um, gently and nudging and encouraging into the competitive side of racing. And uh, how it shows up is that we have um, juniors or, or, or young adults who are competing on a Saturday racing against the adults who probably have been sailing longer than they have been alive but yet taking cups from the adults. So that's kind of telling you how well it's, it's working in terms of building the skills, competency levels, and, and, and ultimately competitiveness of, of, of the membership. QED. Could I just, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No, I... I was going to say, could I take this opportunity to remind you all again, our speaker next week is Richard Nairn on the floor and fauna of Dublin Bay area. The week after that, we have Rick uh, Jensen from Holland, who has been uh, strangely the owner of two Galway hookers, self-built. And I'm sure there'll be some exciting uh, talk, particularly one of them is a steel one. And then the week after that, we have another uh, talk on Galway hookers. It's the building of the uh, iconic uh, Nav uh, Cronon, which is now based in, in Galway. And... Uh, these are great talks uh, to come up. That'll be the final uh, talk uh, for our winter season and uh, our lifeboat uh, fundraisers. And we really appreciate everybody's uh, attendance, contributions, and our speakers. So um, I just thought I'd put that in before everybody drifted away and uh, carry on there. You know, where, you know where to send the money for the lifeboat. Thank you very much. And I just, just checked it there. We've passed the 4,000 mark. Brilliant. Great. Brilliant. Yeah, we're not, uh, we're reminded the of, of a hairy Irish fellow who might have said at the beginnings of, of Live Aid, give us your money. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, I have one question for you. As, as, you know, as, 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 as a father of four sons, if, if I launch myself into, into a life of boat building and sailing, how much do I have to budget for sucky sweets over the next 10 or 15 years? Little is a help. We haven't converted yeah, to Werner's yeah. original uh, because they're they're that bit more expensive, and, and we've convinced ourselves that the little ones are nicer. But but no, there was a, a big big line item of budget for for what we call sucky sweets. I'd suggest you sell two of your children. That would probably solve the problem. <laughs> Might get two packs. Very good. Oh, could I just ask you something? I was looking Tell at indeed. the ballast that you took out of Ariel. Yeah. They were painting it. A lot of it looks suspiciously like uh, sash weight well, from up and down windows. There, there weren't actually, uh, but initially that's what I thought there might have been. Um, yeah. There were axles from railway bogies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah ben, I know that, ben knows to his cost. I know. Yeah, they're about 18, well, maybe a bit, 12 to 18 yeah. inches long. They're all about 20 kilos each. They're just about liftable with one arm. Yeah. yeah. And you do have to grip them with one hand. Not um, far off the mark, anyway. It, it's probably yeah. the be beginnings of the tennis and elbow that I have today. And I know, I think, Ben, you told me you oh, suffered from a bit of I, tennis I, elbow. For about there. two weeks afterwards, I couldn't lift my arm. Yeah. But anyway. That, it's all yeah. part of the crack. I got them out and jet washed them with a high pressure water hose and painted them with the same stuff they use for um, overhead pi electricity pylons. Okay. So some kind of epoxy paint, and that seems to have contained, well, 50%, I suppose. I can't say they're rust proof. And I had all sorts of lengths of chain and everything that I kind of ultimately replaced with other bits and pieces. But yeah, it was, it was yeah. and fishing it out, I, I'd say it hadn't moved in, it, in its 30 years. Um, so imagine the slime and muck and crud that I was getting at the bottom. Yes, yeah, Sam Hurd <laughs> said, why don't you just pour a lot of resin on top of them and that be done with it? And I'm just yeah. not sure I wanted to do that without getting them very, very Well, clean. that's what Kelt, Kelt is, is uh, lead. Um, lead. 
shot type of thing, I think, as far as Sam was telling me, with resin poured in on top of it. That's what he was trying to suggest, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> and some of them do iron punchings, but you have to be careful with the iron punchings if you ever uh, lose the integrity of the seal, that they'll rust and expand. Well, if you put, I have a friend who has a, um, a boat, I don't know what it is, but it's sealed, the iron is sealed inside the resin, yeah. but after 20 years, with rust, it, it, the whole thing begins to disintegrate. It, it's stressed the whole thing because it's expanded. Yeah, yeah. Huge forces, like freezing water in a glass bottle, you know. It, um, there was one boat I looked at, which was a, um, a herd uh, boat. And um, I looked at it and surveyed it myself and the sun drove over and spent uh, kind of two days looking at it. I was really keen on it. Um, it, was, uh, it was a 28. Um, and almost done a deal. I was ready to sign papers in, in the corridors of Cavantini one day, Paul. Um, I, I, I just something didn't feel right. And I rang Sam and I said, like, I, I don't know, what do you think? And he just said, uh, send me some pictures. And he looked up his records and said, oh yeah, that's iron punchings. He said, uh, he, says, uh, he says, you're a nice fella, but he says, you don't need that heartache, give it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, so I took his advice and, and thanked him. But the boat itself was in good shape, but it, uh, and it was coming at a good price. I, it would have just probably broke my spirit. Thank all you all again for this evening, and uh, we'll uh, we we'll meet up again next week, please God. Okay. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful talk this evening. Thank you very, very much. Good. Great talk. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Well done, Joe. Well done. Thank you, Thank you Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for that. Good night, up. Mm.